we will go ahead and move on to our next paper proposal here. I have the privilege of introducing uh, Dr. John Dubois. Trained in experimental psychology and philosophy, Dr. John Dubois is a professor of medical ethics at Washington University at St. Louis where he studies ethical issues surrounding organ transplantation, genomics, and research integrity. His most recent work explores how people's religious faith influences their view towards healthcare issues, such as vaccines and prenatal genetic testing. He has served on the Ethics Committee of the United Network for Organ Sharing. Most of his current work is federally funded social science research. Some of it explores what is right or wrong using secular and sometimes Christian concepts. Please welcome me as I introduce Dr. John Dubois on his paper, Is Organ Donation a Moral Obligation of Orthodox Christians? to tell you, I don't think I've read a paper since graduate school. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, thank you so much for coming, and I'm just thrilled to be at this conference. It's such a beautiful group of people. Um, I decided to address this topic because I've noticed when I talk about organ donation with Orthodox Christians, there really is a lot of uncertainty about it. And, um, I'm hoping that I can offer some consideration to add some clarity, uh, but I'm also hoping to learn from you what you find plausible, implausible, some of it even sharing your intuitions, if it's not an argument or citing tradition, it'd be really helpful to hear, so um, I look forward to our discussion. So, name of the Father, so Orthodox Christian ethics is focused on one thing above all. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If ethics addresses questions such as how should I live, what should I do, then the answer is do what's necessary to restore the image of God in yourself and become united with God in this life and the next. This guiding, the, the guiding principles in all of this are provided by Christ who summarized the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We acquire the strength to do these things through participation in liturgy, penance, fasting, prayer of the heart, obedience, almsgiving, and other forms of participating in the life of the church. Now, all of this is well-traveled ground, but how does this general approach to becoming good help us as we ask questions about healthcare technologies that no church father imagined and no scriptural passage or liturgical hymn mentions. One such technology is organ transplantation. By putting bodies on mechanical ventilators and performing complex surgeries, we may replace an individual's failing organs with those of another human being. This was, of course, impossible throughout nearly all of human history, but it's commonplace today. We've now done over one million organ transplants in the U.S. alone. Orthodox bioethics brings medical information about issues such as organ transplantation into dialogue with the Orthodox tra tradition to assist the faithful in making decisions regarding technologies. This is much needed because in my experience, Orthodox Christians are commonly uncertain about organ donation, wondering, is it forbidden? Is it per per permitted? Or is it perhaps even obligatory? Um, just to foreshadow a little, I will cover what the synods have said about it. And the synods, of course, are able to teach with authority that no ethicist has. Um, but one of the patterns that you see across synodal statements is you get brief conclusions. You don't really understand the, the reasoning or theology behind them. So that's some of what I want to explore today. So part one, the Orthodox Christian case for organ donation. Organ donation saves lives in the ordinary sense of the term. 
If I'm drowning and you throw me a life preserver, you've saved my life, even though I will surely die some years later. Similarly, someone with end-stage liver disease, kidney disease, or heart failure will typically die of their condition without a transplant. And in her book, In God's Hands, the Orthodox mother and teacher, Elisa Yelitich Davis, actually describes a story of her youngest daughter who would have died before the end of her first year without a uh, liver transplant. During his ministry on earth, Jesus healed people, both spiritually and bodily. Healing was an act of compassion and a demonstration of the Father's work through the Son. After Pentecost, his apostles continued his healing ministry. Organ donation would appear to belong you know, to this Christian tradition of healing. It can be a visible demonstration of compassion and love to the dying neighbor. It's also a way of practicing Christian hospitality. Father Toomey, who's an Orthodox bioethicist, reminds us that hospitality uh, in its Greek origin, philosenia, the love of stranger, is central to our worldly mission, since it aspires to bring a strange hum humanity back to God through Christ's incarnation. As opposed to living organ donation, like if you donate one kidney, in deceased organ donation, you're almost always donating to a stranger. And again, Elisa Davis describes this aspect of hospitality as she waited for her daughter to receive a transplant. Quote, I've lost a child, I know how it feels, and I cannot tell you how much it astonishes me that parents can make the choice to give life to other children at the very moment when their child dies. These parents step outside of themselves and show love to people they've never met, to parents sitting vigil in quiet rooms praying for miracles. Today we sit patiently and wait to receive the greatest gift, literally the gift of life, from someone we've never met. We are totally dependent on the kindness of strangers. I believe that the commandment to love neighbor, the orthodox virtue of hospitality, and the healing ministry of Christ together create a strong presumption in favor of organ donation. So accordingly, what I'll, what I'll do in the remainder of the talk is explore a series of um, concerns that people have, or not the whole remainder, but that's the biggest part here. Um, but before doing that, because I know it's a mixed audience, we have physicians as well as chaplains and, and people working in different fields, I want to cover the two pathways to organ donation. So part two, who's actually eligible to donate organs after death? Um, most people assume that if they agree to organ donation, if they sign their driver's license, join the registry, then when they die, their organs will be procured but actually fewer than 1% of people who die in a given year are actually eligible for donation. Donation requires something rare. Um, an individual must die while leaving behind organs that are relatively healthy. So if you think about the most common causes of death, heart disease and cancer, their organs are not usually healthy. Even someone who's relatively healthy, when they die, their organs will ordinarily die with them very quickly because they've lost circulation. There's no oxygen getting to the um, organs. So for organ donors, in contrast to the usual person who dies of heart disease or cancer, the most common causes of death are gunshot injuries, opioid overdoses, motor vehicle accidents, uh, and the thing that they share in common is being on a ventilator following attempted resuscitation, right? So someone incurs one of these injuries or traumas, and um, we try to resuscitate, get the heart going again, get them on a ventilator, but either the brain has already died or it's uh, going to die because of the swelling of the brain inside the, the skull, which has no give, right? So um, U.S. law says that people may be declared dead while they're on a ventilator if they've lost all major brain functions. And this includes primarily consciousness, the ability to, to breathe, 
and brain stem reflexes, like a gag reflex. Uh, so most organ donors are declared dead using these criteria, neurological or brain death. Um, however, a second pathway is procuring organs after the ventilator's been removed. So uh, in this case, the patient has not been declared brain dead. There's usually profound brain damage, um, and the ventilator is removed in about five minutes afterwards, uh, organs can be procured. So I'll talk about that separately. Um, that's donation after circulatory death or DCD. So part three, exploring concerns with organ donation. Concern one, is brain death really death? Might organ donation actually cause death? I'm just curious, does anyone worry about this in the room? Maybe not. It's a real medical crowd. I saw maybe a couple hands. Um, it's certainly something I wrestled with, right? But um, we'll look at this. So as noted already, uh, when organ donation follows a de declaration of brain death, the body is still on a ventilator. It's still pink, warm, and capable of processing urine. In short, the, the body shows a lot of signs of life, which leads some people to question whether brain donors are truly dead. Now on this, um, Tris Engelhart, who is an um, orthodox bioethicist and physician, says that after the early periods of gestation, when the person's brain is destroyed, that person's dead, although certain biological signs of life may continue at the level of tissues and organs. The remains of the body can be transplanted without transplanting the person. Um, similarly, Father John Breck writes, from a Christian perspective, the most basic requirement for personhood is the unity of the body and soul. And however we define soul, it's clearly related to brain function, though it's not related only to that. And therefore, once brain death occurs, the organism is dead. Both Engelhart and Father Breck offer their support for whole brain death criteria. Uh, and this doesn't exclude the survival of some brain functions, rather they focus on the permanent loss of two central features, capacity for consciousness and the ability to breathe. Now it's important to note, brain death is not the same as persistent vegetative state, right? So Terry Schiavo was our most uh, famous case of PBS in the US, and they typically have eyes open coma, they're able to breathe spontaneously. Um, they retain brain, re brain stem reflexes. So um, I think it's very important that we as a nation continue to reject uh, the use of higher brain death criteria, partly because of the significance of breathing. And here I just want to pause for a moment and hear from Matthew Pacho, um, uh, budding theologian on the symbolism of the Genesis creation narratives, where he says that in the story of the Garden of Eden, humanity is described as a microcosm of creation. Thus, Adam is created by joining a body of the earth and a breath from heaven. The word spirit simultaneously refers to the wind of heaven and the breath of living creatures. These are one and the same in biblical cosmology. Moreover, breath is closely tied to the ability of the conscious mind to express itself. We cannot speak without breath. Accordingly, within Pajot's interpretation of the creation of Adam, the head represents the source of meaning for the body, giving it, uh, given its link to breath. So, the second concern is whether DCD criteria or circulatory criteria uh, are sufficient to ensure that the donor has died. Um, I think these days among physicians, these tend to be the more controversial uh, criteria. Among lay people, it's just the opposite, all right? But with DCD criteria, this involves removing the ventilator and waiting about five minutes for the loss of circulation or after the loss of circulation you could wait up to 60 minutes or so for circulation to be lost, but then you wait five minutes afterwards before pronouncing the patient. 
Um, this is, this five minute wait period is considered long enough to rule out auto resuscitation or spontaneous resumption of circulation. Um, but people still worry about it because they know some people are resuscitated after more than five minutes of being down. So um, here, you know, I think there's a few key points that um, really, um, in this case, the the criteria are, are fine to use as long as the patient has no chance of recovery and the decision to remove the ventilator is legitimate. Now, once they have a do not resuscitate order, you're not going to attempt resuscitation after five minutes. If you leave, wait at least five minutes to rule out spontaneous resumption, then essentially all circulation to the brain is permanently lost. Consciousness has been permanently lost. We lose consciousness, breath, and uh, brainstem reflexes within about 30 seconds of losing circulation. It happens very, very fast. So if circulation won't be restored, all your brain functions are also permanently lost. Now I'm gonna to get to a more distinctively orthodox concern, I think. Um, is it sacrilegious to cut up and remove organs from a body that is sanctified by the sacraments? That's what I think a lot of people worry about. The Orthodox Christian tradition strongly opposes cremation. Deacon Mark Barna, author of A Christian Ending, explains that all bodies are sacred insofar as they preserve the image of God, but the body of one that was baptized, anointed, um, and receive the Eucharist is particularly sacred and must be treated as such. Cremation destroys the body, whereas traditional burial without the embalming in the concrete vaults widely used in the U.S. permits the body to quickly return to the earth from which it came. Orthodox funeral rites require the presence of a body. So this might seem to speak against organ and tissue donation, which involves surgical removal of solid organs and um, intestines, some skin, some bone, corneas, and other tissues. The Orthodox moral theologian, Father John Breck, has noted that some Orthodox Christians have opposed organ donation for this reason. However, I think there are several, conclusions, uh, several considerations that make this conclusion questionable. First, cremation is not motivated by love, hospitality, and the desire to extend Christ's healing mission. Second, there's precedence within the Orthodox tradition for using pieces of the deceased body for healing, namely relics. Pilgrims frequently travel to visit relics that have been associated with physical healing. Relics may consist of a whole, incorrupt body, a skull, bones, or even desiccated portions of the body, such as fingers. Thus, we know it's possible to use portions of a deceased body for the purpose of healing in a spirit of love and respect. Finally, in the Book of Needs, we read a prayer for those about to undergo uh, an operation. O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, who patiently endured the scourging and wounding of your most holy body, so that you might save the souls and bodies of your people, look graciously, we beseech you, upon the suffering body of this your servant, granting that she may so endure her sufferings in the flesh, that the wounding of her body may serve for the correcting and salvation of her soul. So this illustrates, I think, two points. First, Christ allowed his body to be cut and wounded for the healing of others. And second, every surgery patient does the same for the healing of their own bodies. So how much more, then, is it allowable for us to undergo some degree of bodily harm after death to save the life of another? Concern for, is organ donation compatible with orthodox funeral rituals, which ordinarily involve an open casket and a prompt burial? So, Organ donation can lead to some delays, about a day on average, in delivering a body to the funeral home or a similar destination. However, it generally does not preclude a prompt burial without embalming or an open casket. The process of achieving this may not seem very natural. Um, I actually called our local, local organ procurement organization to ask about this question of the open casket 
to get more details um, and was told they use uh, PVC piping to replace bones when they remove it to preserve the integrity of the body there. Desiccants may be applied where skin was removed to prevent oozing. Plastics may need to be placed under the garments um, in the uh, casket. Death, though, is never very natural. Deacon Barna uh, makes this point. Um, death is not natural. And he describes a traditional Orthodox approach to burial. And he talks about sometimes needing to use ice to prevent the risk of odors, to superglue lips, to keep the jaw closed. Um, he says, this is not how things were meant to be. It's ugly, and it's the main consequence of sin. He repeats over and over, death is not natural. This is not how it should be. So um, when we have this strong visceral reaction toward organ donation, this is not natural. This isn't going to be beautiful. That's true. That's always true in death. Concern five, does the influence of money pervert organ donation? This is my last concern, by the way. Deacon Barnett, in a Christian ending, writes that he has signed his donor card, but he's considering rescinding it, and he offers two interrelated concerns. First, he claims that the transplant system is almost completely unregulated, and that this leads to terrible things, such as transplant tourism and organs being shipped abroad for profit. Second, he claims that everyone is making a profit off of transplantation except the donors, while also complaining that there's a market in organs and some people are being exploited. He writes that he now might permit organ donation only on condition that his organs are used locally, and he encourages others to do the same. So I strongly agree with Deacon Barna's uh, general concerns that organ donation needs to be regulated, and that the human body must not be commodified. However, his specific concerns are not valid when referring to the U.S. context into solid organ uh, transplantation rather than tissue donation. I've served on the governing board of our local organ procurement organization, or OPO, and according to U.S. law, all OPOs must be nonprofit entities. It's currently illegal to pay for organs in the U.S., though this is legal in some countries such as Iran. And organ transplantation is highly, highly regulated. And one of the regulations actually requires broad sharing of organs across state lines when it's feasible. So it's precisely because it's so regulated that no OPO could honor a wish to say the organs must be used just locally. All right. They will always be used within the U.S. if there's a suitable recipient. Um, so, I think a further word on payments for organ donation is merited, and in part because some Orthodox bioethicists have actually argued in support um, of the sale of human organs, but their arguments are largely secular. The overwhelming opinion is that the sacred should never be treated as an object that's for sale, and that one cannot serve both God and man. The only justification for the violence done to the body at the time of mourning and of Christian burial rituals is love of neighbor, the desire to be God's instrument of healing. The National Organ Transplant Act currently forbids payments for deceased organ donation, but if this changes, and it could, every few years there are pushes to allow it, I believe that um, Orthodox Christians may need to refuse payments. Uh, to be clear, from a transplant community perspective, the primary purpose of payments is precisely to serve as an incentive to create a motivation for donation, and such a motive is not permissible regarding the donation of a human body. So there are many other questions about organ donation that could be explored. Are there some organs that are too special to donate? Um, might my organs be no donated to someone who doesn't deserve them? Um, I'm not going to get into all of these right now. I can just tell you I've got another list of questions I plan to go through. Um, I don't think any of them are decisive. or They certainly wouldn't lead me to choose against organ 
donation. Very briefly, part four statement of orthodox synods. I've identified and reviewed um, synodal statements on organ donation from six different jurisdictions. These statements range from one paragraph to several pages in length. All of them state organ donation is permissible under specific conditions. It must be voluntary, a gesture of love or altruism, and free from financial payments. At the same time, circling back to the main question I posed earlier, none of them speaks of an obligation or a duty to donate. They emphasize rather that the gesture of love requires freedom and voluntariness. So part five, really short, my conclusion, the freedom and responsibility of conscience. The title of this paper asks, is organ donation after death a moral obligation of Orthodox Christians? The answer is not simple. The synods that have addressed organ donation speak of the permissibility and goodness of donation but stop short of referring to an obligation. The Orthodox tradition emphasizes that donating organs must be voluntary. But to borrow a phrase from the Orthodox bioethicist Deacon Samson Nash, not everything that's voluntary is optional. For those who have prayed about the decision and overcome concerns with organ donation, as I have at this time, granting permission for organ donation after death may in fact be an obligation. Thus, the question about an obligation to donate organs is complex precisely because it cannot be answered for all people at all times. It's a mistake to think, as many bioethicists do, that all obligations are general. We are all generally obliged to practice love of neighbor, to provide hospitality, and to offer healing to others. But how we do this may look different for different Christians. Thank you. So my question is, um, say there were more freedom to make this choice and we could make this decision now, people would, didn't feel some obligation to uh, orthodoxy or some other preconceived ethical obligation, how does that change what's actually happening? Let's assume the infrastructure is in place, how does, it, how does that mean that more people are getting organs? Are we still stuck in the same place that either it's they're old and infirm, and they're not good, they're diseased, or they were destroyed beyond recognition. So how does it actually, even, even if they, that's not a question, we can just do it, how does that change, you know, statistically in, in, in America? That's great, thank you. Um, over the years, uh, a, a much higher percentage of Americans have joined the organ donation registry. So that's if it, the driver's bureau, you say, yes, I want to be a donor, or if you go online and join it, you're on the registry. That is considered first person authorization. So one of the big differences is um, they inform the family that you're an organ donor. They're not asking, okay? Mm -hmm. When that happens, there's a much higher likelihood that you will proceed to, to organ donation. Um, I think for people who have concerns, uh, delegating the decision to family who can keep an eye on things, you know, if people are very mistrustful, I think that's a legitimate approach. Talking to your family about your wishes, though, is crucial because you don't want family members upset and surprised by this one day delay and um, the idea of organ donation. You want them to be aware um, of your wishes. So, you know, you're right. It doesn't change the fact that only 1% of people are eligible to donate. But if you do die in those fashions, right, and I hope that never happens, it's easier for you to become a donor if you join the registry. Well, what I wanted to know was, let's say we don't have those restrictions and the family members, everyone's on board. Let's say that this is a common thing. How many lives are saved as a result of organ donation? How much does that rise from you know, some percentage that exists today. I, I, I'm still not quite sure I'm getting it. So what I, what I can tell you is this. So 
there's seven solid organs that can be donated. I think on average, when someone becomes a donor, it's three to four organs um, that are actually transplanted. Lots of different tissues can be transplanted. So each donor is having that kind of impact, right? Um, but the, you know, the actual number, the improvement, would depend on how many actually join the registry. There are some countries have what um, is sometimes called presumed consent. Um, I prefer the term an opt-out system, where you're sort of automatically a donor unless you opt out of the system. But that's not currently the U.S. approach. And I, and I think the synodal statements that emphasize so much the need for voluntariness would probably lean away from that. So, so what I mean is, what if everyone in America was on the registry? Oh, everyone. Everyone, everyone has signed up. And so how many lives are being saved? We have over 100,000 people on the donation waiting list. Um, some of them can survive for years, for example, on dialysis. A majority, about 70,000, are in need of a kidney transplant, right? I think with that level of um, authorization of organ donation, it is possible the waiting list would be eliminated. It certainly would be eliminated for uh, certain organs like heart and lung. Um, it's a good, good question that you're asking, and I'm, I'm not certain, but I, that's the number on the waiting list, and it would certainly go a long way. We usually do maybe about 30,000 transplants, so we're always running behind and the list tends to grow, it would, it would significantly shrink that. Yeah. I, I was just wondering if there's enough healthy, you know, organs in America to be actually able to, if we all agree, would they actually be able to meet the demand? Yeah, no, it's, I understand your question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. I, have, um, I also have a question, I, but I, I just want to say thank you for the talk that you just gave. Um, I want to put at ease anyone who thinks this is a monetary thing because I work in the ICU and I see I'm part of the ICU team. I'm a dietitian, but my job is to provide nutrition support, IV support. Um, and every day, every morning, we round on each patient and the decision to, to call Gift of Hope, which is the donation company, there's no monetary thinking in that decision. It's all, you know, like you were saying, can we call Gift of Hope to donate the organ? Um, is it feasible? Can we do that? And if we can, then we don't, we call them, but it's, it has nothing to do with money yeah. when those decisions are made. Um, I guess those, the question that I have for you though is, I know you spoke like something about love. You do it out mm -hmm. of love. A lot of, as you said, a lot of the, and I work in a trauma unit, so a lot of the people that come in are, um, they can't make that decision. Mm -hmm. They're young, mm -hmm. and they, you know, um, they were in a gunshot wound, an accident. Um, some are drug abusers. So they obviously probably didn't sign that organ donation, you know, whatever it is to sign. And from my understanding, the family is left to make that decision. Yes. Is that true? I mean, or do they have to sign it? Do you know? Oh, no. Um, if someone from has... My, from what I see, yeah. the families are left with that decision. I, that's I right. Feel, I feel like that's what I see, but I don't know legally if that's how it is. No, that's exactly right. If someone has not joined the uh, donor registry, they would ask next to kin or family, and mm -hmm. they would be authorized to make that decision. Yeah. So, yeah. so then I guess my question is, it's coming out of love of the parents giving up the organs of their child. It's not necessarily the child, which a child, I'm talking about 20-year-olds. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so the, the love, it's not necessarily the 20-year-old's love, yeah. but it's the love of the parent. Is that acceptable? I think it is, and, and that's exactly what um, Elisa Bielitich Davis talks about in her book, In God's Hands, that, um, you know, she was hoping for a liver for her baby, who was not even a year old, 
and that was going to have to come from a pediatric donor. And um, she was just talking about the incredible generosity um, of someone who's willing to make a gift to strangers at that point um, after losing a child. And, and it just, you know, as she said, she's just continually astonished by that. But I, I think that is also an absolutely legitimate um, motivation and source of authorization for donation. So thank you so much for your talk. Um, I had a question about what organ donation regulations and needs looks like globally. Um, I am not in the field, so your paper presentation was enlightening in so much that I found out a little bit more about what it looks like in the States. Um, but I'm curious to know how different parts of the world, if you have any information on that, what the demand looks like, what the waiting list looks like, and also regulatory concerns there might be outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of variation, I can tell you that. There's a lot of variation in even how we procure organs. There's a protocol called uncontrolled donation after cardiac death or circulatory death, which is more if someone collapses on the street, having a heart attack. Um, in some countries, it's quite common to start resuscitation, bring them to the emergency room, and after, there's always a fixed amount of time you have to try, 30 minutes. Um, if you do not um, manage to resuscitate the patient, they could immediately go into surgery, or cooling fluid is put in the body to preserve the organs briefly. Um, that works better in countries that have presumed consent or opt-out systems because you can act um, without family authorization in those cases, right? So you see a lot of variation out there. Um, you know, the European, the Canadian systems are very similar to the US, but you do have more of the rapid organ recovery or uncontrolled in Europe. Um, there are nations where you do see transplant tourism. Um, you know, people who are flying to, say, a developing country where it's either legal to sell your organs or there's a thriving black market. And so that was what Deacon Barna, I, I think, you know, he's hearing these stories and that becomes a reality of organ donation, but that is a more localized issue. No, you know the United Network for Organ Sharing. I was on their ethics committee and it came up, what do you do if someone from the U.S. flies and buys an organ? Which again would be illegal here and that's not, fortunately that's not common here. Um, but the question was could you give them follow-up care? And there were a lot of transplant physicians who said no, we should not give follow-up care. That's the only way to discourage it. Um, coming from healthcare ethics, I mean, I guess I don't think anyone deserves the organs of someone else. You could get all, you get horrible considerations, like what if someone was an alcoholic and they ruined their own liver, do they deserve a second liver, what if they ruined that one? And in general, you know, it just shies away from any kind of judgment of social worth of the organ recipient, so, um, you know, occasionally the international setting does point challenge, pr 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 present challenges for care in the U.S., but, um, you know, it is a very different context right now here, yeah. And just a quick follow-up to that, sorry, Nabi. Um, which countries, off the top of your head, opt, have the opt-out procedure for process? <sighs> You know, I, I would have to look into that. I believe Spain was one of the first to do it, and um, it did make a very significant um, shift in the number of organs that are available for transplant. It would have a much lower impact in the U.S., partly because we have fairly high consent rates already. They had very low consent rates when they passed their law. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'm curious to hear what your opinion is kind of on the moral obligation as 
uh, living donors. So um, mm. we have a close um, friend who's awaiting a kidney donation. Um, and so, you know, our parish was involved in kind of hearing his story and his need. And um, it's kind of raised conversations, right, among yeah. our, you know, families and friends of um, what it means to be a living donor, donating, what is it called, like a do specific recipient, to a specific recipient. Mm -hmm. um, and just thinking through the moral obligations of what that means and then our fear and control, right, of what if one of our future children needs it? What if a sibling needs it? What if, what if it causes risk, you know, to self or other? Um, and just kind of hearing some of your thoughts on the moral obligation there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that, that has actually, I think, been addressed less by the synods. Sometimes the synods have addressed it. Sometimes I feel like they were trying to talk about it, but they didn't call it out separately, <laughs> you know? So I don't know that there's a good synodal level answer to that. But, um, you know, with deceased donation, for me, one of the things that makes it so compelling is precisely you're deceased. Um, in, your body should still be treated respectfully, but you're beyond harm in terms of a living, unified body, right? Now, in living donation, it's different. Kidney donation is generally considered to be very safe. But I will tell you this, right? Medical associations that look at fighting sports, say kickboxing, um, you know, serious damage to internal organs like kidneys is actually more common than, um, you know, permanent brain damage. And no physician will say, oh, the person got kicked, the kidney was so badly damaged they had to surgically remove it. No physician will say there was no injury. <laughs> there was an injury. There was a very serious injury. And now you have just one kidney left, right? So I, I think it's an incredibly generous act. I, I do think the things that you mentioned, thinking of your future health, your future risk for kidney disease, does kidney disease run in your family? Might you need to donate to a, a child or a parent? Um, these are all legitimate things. I, I think this is a, a little bit more like someone saying, rather than just the standard tithe, I'm going to sell my house and give to the poor. This is a very radical act of generosity, right? So um, I think as long as there's nothing that makes the choice irresponsible on your part, right, um, then, then it would be permissible. It would just certainly not be obligatory for the um, ordinary person. But as I said, I think, you know, Standard secular ethics was so influenced by a philosopher, Kant, who basically said, um, morality is all about when you make a choice, that choice should be universalizable. It should apply to everyone in a similar situation. I think that's really absolutely opposed to orthodoxy, <laughs> you know, where um, no one would just sell their house and give it all away without praying about it and feeling a really strong call to do something that radical, right? And, and so I think it would be similar with living organ donation. I would never presume to say there's a one-size-fits-all answer there. Yep. Thank you. Thanks.